Thank you very much indeed, uh, David. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very uh, good evening to you all, or good morning or good day, depending on which uh, time zone uh, you're in. Um, I'm sorry I can't address you in, in person because the WFA branches always produce a very good cup of tea and occasionally even a slice of cake. Uh, but I shall just have to forgo that. And uh, because of Black Death too, I'm talking to you from my study uh, in, in Kent. And I'm going to talk about the, the Indian Army in the First World War because, surprisingly, uh, not many people know of, that there were Indian soldiers on the Western Front. Um, obviously, you as members of the WFA do, but the, the general public doesn't, uh, which is perhaps surprising because India mobilized more men than Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa put together and had more men killed than any of them. Uh, but there's been a lot less publicity, perhaps, to the Indians uh, than there have been to the armies of the Dominions, very valuable though they were. It was said at the time, and it's been said many times since, that the BEF, who went across to um, Belgium and France in 1914, uh, were the best led, best equipped, and best trained body of troops ever to have left these shores. And I think that was probably right. But it was tiny. Um, four infantry divisions and an independent brigade compared to 62 French infantry divisions. One cavalry division compared to 10 French cavalry divisions. So if the British are to have any um, impact at all on the war on the Western Front and in other fronts, then that army has got to be expanded and it's got to be expanded rapidly. But where are those reinforcements going to come from? Eventually, the territorial force will come on, screen, on stream, uh, but as yet, not all their members have signed up for general service, and they, they're still being re-equipped, uh, ready to take the field. And they'll, they'll come on in time, but, but not yet. Uh, the new armies being raised from 1914 onwards, again, in time, they will make their presence felt, but it won't be yet. They're still untrained and, of course, uh, inexperienced. Uh, the armies of the White Dominions, Canada, Australia, uh, their armies are tiny, a few hundred strong. They, their defense is based on the militia system. Fair enough. Who's going to invade Canada? Uh, who's going to invade Australia? And in time, they will make a very definite and very important contribution. But that time will not be yet. In 1914, the only source of trained regular manpower was the British Indian Army which was 155,000 strong in 1914. Now, prior to 1914, the two secretaries of state for India who boxed and coxed with each other, Morley and Crewe, uh, they had said several times to the Indian government, if there is a European war, you, India, will not be involved. Now, that was nothing to do uh, with the idea of not wanting brown men to be fighting white men, which I've sometimes read in some books. Uh, it was nothing to do with that. It was all to do with money. It was budgetary. If the Indian Army uh, was officially uh, supposed to be ready for a war against a first-class enemy, in other words, to take part in a European war, uh, then they would have to be equipped to the standard of the British Army. Now, their existing equipment was perfectly good enough for the defense of India's frontiers and campaigns in India's near abroad. Uh, but to bring it up to the standards of the British Army would cost money. And neither the British Army, uh, the British government, nor the Indian government wanted to spend that money. Now, fortunately, the Indian Army didn't really pay any attention. Uh, they thought that uh, whatever the British government may be saying, if there is a European war, and increasingly people thought there was going to be, uh, then they would somehow uh, be involved. And of course, uh, sure enough, uh, they were. Um, the Indian Army was in no sense representative of the population of India. Uh, it wasn't then, and indeed it's, it's not now. <clears throat> Ever since 1857, and the so-called Indian mutiny, uh, I don't like the phrase Indian mutiny, it started as a mutiny of part of the Bengal Army, one of the three British Indian armies, the other two uh, didn't mutiny, the Madras Army and the Bombay Army, um, when that was eventually put down, then those races that have been disloyal no longer were recruited, 
those regiments that had mutinied were disbanded, and the recruiting line moved further and further north. So by 1914, we're getting Sikhs and Jats from the Punjab uh, up here, Rajputs from the north, Gokas from Nepal, uh, Garwal, Garwal is from, from Garwal. Um, the exception to that was the Marathas who live in central India, and there were a great deal of Marathas uh, in the cavalry, but they'd, um, they'd proven their loyalty uh, to the Raj over, over many, many years. Um, the Indian army recruited on the basis of what was called the martial races. Now, it was a pretty unscientific theory, but basically what it said was that there are certain races that are better at soldiering than others. Um, now, of course, today it's frankly um, unpolitically correct to suggest that any race could possibly be better than any other race. But um, common sense will tell you that if you had to get up and attack a well-armed, determined, well-equipped enemy in defense of a good defensive position, would you rather have a dozen Sikhs behind you or a hundred of some other races, which I won't mention because I don't want the political correctness Gestapo knocking on my door? It's common sense. Uh, there may not be anything scientific about it, but on the theory that if it isn't broke, don't fix it, um, the British knew that the races from which they recruited their army, they were soldiers, they were good at it, they knew what to do. So although the population of India was 256 million in 1914, uh, the army was recruited from a much smaller population base uh, than that. Um, I've put some of the martial races up on that slide. Top left are the Punjabi Muslims. Now, Punjabi Muslims, they were known as the backbone of the Indian army. There were an awful lot of them, both in the infantry um, and in the sappers and miners and in the cavalry. Um, it's worth pointing out there were an awful lot of Muslims fighting for us in both the First War and the Second World War. Uh, it's worth emphasizing that at a time when people seem to think that every Muslim wants to blow us up. Um, it's not Islam that's the problem. It's extremism. Any extremism of any religion is dangerous and, and a threat. Um, if you read the Quran, bearing in mind the context in which it was written and the time at which it was written, you will find very little uh, that you would object to, uh, rather like the Old Testament. Again, the context and the time in which it's, it's written. I often say that the only difference between uh, ISIS <clears throat> and some of the rather nastier Northern Ireland terrorists uh, is that uh, Northern Irish terrorists don't blow themselves up, at least not deliberately. So a lot of Muslims. Um, top right, uh, Sikhs, again, a lot of Sikhs in the British Indian Army, and a number of Sikh academics have said to me that if it wasn't for the army, Sikhism would have been reabsorbed into that sort of primordial Hindu soup that they had emerged from. But the army only recruited baptized Sikhs. Uh, the army insisted that the five Ks, uh, the tenets of uh, Sikh belief, the, the kesh, the hair, kirpan, the dagger, kanga, the comb, kara, the bracelet, katra, the, the shorts, uh, were preserved in the army. Uh, and it's, it was the army, really, that kept Sikhism going at a time when it could quite easily have, uh, have disappeared. Um, they did have a thing about helmets. Uh, Sikhs wouldn't wear helmets. Uh, it was no use reminding them that the soldiers of Ranjit Singh and the Sikh Empire of Lahore wore steel caps. That didn't matter. They didn't wear helmets. Uh, there was one occasion when a, on the Western Front when a Sikh cavalry regiment was trotting up to the front line um, and they were stopped uh, by an irate staff officer who said, why aren't you wearing helmets? Uh, and they were all issued with helmets, which they duly put over their turbans and off they went. And when they got round the next corner, they met an empty truck coming back, a wagon coming back, and all the helmets went into the wagon. And that was that. And they never did uh, wear helmets. The little chap in the back, um, you can see, who hasn't got a beard because he's far too young. He is not actually a British army. Uh, the other three are. Uh, he is a young officer of one of the state's forces. Now, as you know, not all of India was British India. 
there were a whole lot of uh, princely states, as they were known, which were independent, or nominally independent. Uh, some of them tiny, not much bigger than, than a few English villages, some enormous, like Hyderabad, which was 800 miles from north to south. Um, and they had their own governments. And as long as they adhered to reasonable standards of, of um, uh, human rights, although the expression, of course, wasn't known then, uh, then, then the British were perfectly happy. They all had their own little armies. And there was a system called the Imperial Service Scheme, which was if the armies of the princely states uh, signed up for imperial assistance, if the empire went to war, then they were trained and equipped uh, as for the British army. And they had British officers there to train them. And the little chap in the back uh, is from one of the princely state contingents uh, that, that came, to the, came to the Western Front. Um, bottom left, Gorkas, of course, uh, lots of Gorkas, uh, six battalions of them on the Western Front. Uh, and they're the one remnant, of remnant's the wrong word, but the run, one bit of the old British Indian Army that, of course, is still with us today. And I'm delighted to say that for the first time in my service is actually expanding which is very good news. Bottom right, Rajputs, again, up from, from the north, and they would probably have considered themselves to be rather superior chaps uh, to anybody else uh, in India. Indian regiments were divided, and there were two sorts of, of Indian regiment. Uh, there was the class regiment and the class company regiment. Now, the class regiment uh, was where everybody in the regiment was on the same race. All Sikhs, all Gorkhas, uh, all Rajputs, all Dogras, uh, all, all Punjabi Muslimen, or, or whatever. And a class company regiment was a regiment where there were companies of different races. Now, for example, 47th Wilds Rifles had a company of Sikhs, company of Dogras, company of Patans, um, and a company of um, Punjabi Muslimen. So four different races. And there used to be great discussion arguments sometimes between British officers as to which was best. Was it best to have a class regiment or a class company regiment? Uh, the answer is, of course, they were both uh, equally good, but, but different. Um, the cynics would have said that a class company regiment was less likely to mutiny, and there was always somebody to do fatigues on a religious holiday. On the other hand, administration in a class regiment was rather easier because they only had to produce one ration. In a class company regiment, then each company uh, had their own cookhouse. Food action rations wasn't really a problem. Of course, um, Hindus uh, don't eat beef, uh, Muslims don't eat pork, but everybody ate goat and mutton and, and chicken. And they could all be obtained in France Rice is grown in, in the south of France, down around Marseille, and uh, atta to make chapatis could be easily imported from India. So food uh, wasn't a problem. Um, Indian soldiers liked their food on the hoof, preferably as fresh as possible. They would like a live sheep, which they could kill, butcher, cook, and, and eat. And in a land where refrigeration uh, was not universally available, that, of course, made a lot of sense. The army uh, suggested that perhaps they'd accept frozen meat. So the soldiers were uh, consulted and they all said, yes, perfectly happy, frozen meat, no problem. The next question was, would they accept tinned meat? Yep, absolutely, no problem at all. The problem then arose that the contract for tinned mutton, which would be eaten by everybody, uh, was let by British staff officers and not British Indian staff officers. And the company that got the contract had as its logo a raging bull. And as people looked at the label, they, you know, what's on the label is in the tin. And the assumption was this isn't mutton, this is beef. So that, um, of course, couldn't be eaten by very large numbers of the Indian Army contingent. Um, and that uh, that, that was, that was cancelled, and from then on it was either fresh uh, or frozen. Uh, and rations actually were never a problem on the, on the Western Front. Um, British officers of the Indian Army, um, there were two types of officer. There was the British officer and the Viceroy commissioned officer. The British officer, uh, who held, of course, the King's Commission, now in a battalion, an Indian infantry battalion, there were only 11 British officers. 
uh, as opposed to 35 or so in a British battalion. Uh, and the 11 British officers were the commanding officer, four company commanders, four company officers who were subalterns sort of learning their trade, uh, the adjutant uh, and the, the quartermaster. Um, the 12th officer was the doctor. And he was not necessarily British. He came from the Indian Medical Service. So he might be British uh, or he might be, he might be Indian. How did you get to the Indian Army? You had to pass out in the top 10% from Sandhurst if you were going to the, if you wanted to go to the Indian Infantry or the Indian Cavalry. And the top 10% uh, from Woolwich if you wanted to go to the uh, Sappers and Miners, which were the equivalent of the, of the engineers. Uh, you then, having been accepted from Sandhurst, uh, you went off to India and you spent a year with a British battalion in India. And what you had to do then was to learn, first of all, Urdu, the Urdu language, because that was the lingua franca uh, of the Indian Army. Um, every officer in the Indian Army and every Viceroy's commissioned officer, that's Indian officer, had to speak Urdu. And the instruction manuals and all the rest of it were printed in Urdu. Having passed the Urdu exam, the young officer then had to learn the language of the regiment that he was going to. So if he's going to a, a Gokha regiment, he will learn Gokhali or Nepali as we now call it. Uh, if he's going to, to somebody up in the Punjab, he'd learn Punjabi, it might be Gurumukya, it might be Hindi or, or whatever. And once he'd passed that language and qualified, then he could go to his Indian regiment because there was no point, no use, nothing that a young officer could do until he could speak the language. If you can't talk to soldiers, uh, how can you possibly uh, command them? The other uh, type of officer uh, was the, the Viceroy commissioned officer. He held a commission from the Viceroy as opposed to the, the king. Uh, and there were there were three ranks, Jemadar, roughly equivalent to, to a lieutenant. They were platoon commanders. Subadars, uh, roughly equivalent to captain. They were company second in commands. And the Subdar major, of which there was only one. Uh, and he was the senior native officer, the senior Indian officer, and, and a very, very important man. Uh, and indeed, uh, in a, in a Gokha battalion in the British Army today, the, the Gokha major, the equivalent of the Subodar major, is, uh, is a very, very important chap. Um, in the cavalry, it was Jemadar, Rissaldar, and Rissaldar major. These were people who were commissioned from the ranks. They joined as private soldier equivalent. Uh, they became lance knights, lance corporals, knights, corporals, haldars, sergeants, uh, possibly haldar majors and normally commissioned at about the 15, 16, 17 year point. So tremendously experienced. So you would have a company uh, in an Indian infantry battalion, quite possibly commanded by a lieutenant who perhaps only got two or three years service. And his second in command would be a viceroy commissioned officer, uh, a subdar with perhaps 25 years service. So you had the, the, the education of the British officer uh, and the experience of the Indian officer, and the two worked exceedingly well together. Um, uh, that's really one of the reasons why the Indian Army was so successful. It was this extraordinary symbiosis, symbiosis between the, the, the British or the young British officer and the, the very experienced um, Indian officer. Um, and as I say, they were platoon commanders and company second commands. That uh, picture that I put up is of um, Subhadar, uh, well, ultimately Subhadar Major, he was then a Subhadar, Kudirad Khan. Um, he was the first Indian Victoria Cross. Now, uh, prior to 1911, the Indian Army was not eligible for the Victoria Cross. The Victoria Cross then was only eligible uh, to British ranks. And then from 1911, it was thrown open to the whole of the empire. Uh, so their first one it was in 1914, Kudadad Khan. He was in fact a Pathan, um, and uh, he was a machine gun officer. And uh, he, he fought uh, very gallantly uh, when the Germans attacked in the first Battle of Eat and won a Victoria Cross. Um, I talked about the, uh, this combination of the British and the, the Indian officers. This is a photograph of the 129th Baluch, which was a class regiment, uh, all Muslims, 
It's clearly a posed photograph, but it was taken near Wichats in October 1914 before the Germans attack and, and take Messines Ridge. Um, you can see the, uh, the Subdar, the company second command, there he is, uh, and the company commander. Uh, the company commander, I see, has put a totally uh, non-regulation chin strap, presumably because he couldn't tie a turban quite as well as the soldiers did and had the chin strap uh, put on it to make sure it didn't, it didn't fall off. So the war uh, breaks out on the, on the 4th of August. Uh, that same day, despite the Indian Army having been told they wouldn't be involved, that same day, um, a one division was mobilized and ordered to embark for Persia. <clears throat> now, there's an awful lot of oil in Persia, and Britain owned most of it. Uh, so to make sure that it was uh, protected and safe, an Indian division, 6th Pune division, was sent off uh, to guard it. And on the 6th of August, two days after the declaration of war, two divisions and a cavalry brigade were ordered to mobilize for the Western Front. So that's a, that's a pretty quick uh, volt fast uh, by, the, by the British government. Well, the Indian Army were well prepared for that because, as I said earlier, they didn't believe that they wouldn't be involved. Uh, and very quickly, the men uh, were got together. It was difficult in some cases because it was the leave season in India. Um, it was the end of the monsoon. Uh, men were on leave, so people had to be sent off to all the far corners of the Indian Empire, <clears throat> including places like uh, Nepal, which was very difficult to get to and difficult to move around, and Garhwal, um, and, and get the chaps who'd been on leave to get them, get them back. Um, and they embarked at Bombay and Karachi. Um, that's a photograph of um, the, the embarkation. Now, most of the, the chaps with turbans um, are dockyard coolies doing the loading. Uh, you can see the chaps with the Bombay bowlers. They're obviously uh, British. Um, this chap here with a medal, he's, he's got a brass medal around his neck. He is an official follower. Now, unlike the British Army, the Indian Army had said, look, there's an awful lot of jobs that have to be done, but they don't have to be done by soldiers. The cooks don't have to be soldiers. The chaps who cut the grass don't have to be soldiers. The grooms don't have to be soldiers. Um, so they employed civilians known as followers, civilian followers in, in these various, various jobs. Um, now, they didn't have to follow uh, their officers uh, or their battalions to the Western Front, but to their enormous credit, they all did. Uh, they served remarkably well uh, throughout the war for, for really not very, very much money. Uh, they were paid a lot less than a, than a soldier. <clears throat> and uh, they did wonderful work. Um, you know, they're in the trenches. It's raining. It's being shelled. And one of the followers will still make his way up the communication trench uh, with the Saab's bacon and eggs uh, for the, perhaps the one British officer uh, in, in, in that area uh, of the of the trenches so they were they were jolly good chaps they they were followers some of them had been their families had been following the same regiment for generations after after generations well they uh, they were embarked on ships uh, and escorted by the royal navy uh, and off they went via the Suez canal uh, one brigade was held back in the Suez canal to guard the canal uh, until a territorial force brigade could arrive to release them. Uh, the rest of them uh, got to Marseille and, uh, and they arrived in, in Marseille, mostly still in their Indian summer uniforms. Now, on arrival, they had a fair bit of sorting out to do because the British Army in 1913 had gone from an eight company battalion, uh, eight fairly small companies, about 80 men each, to four, four rifle companies. Um, but the Indian Army had stayed with the eight company system, where one British officer was the double company commander and, and looked after two companies. Um, on arrival at, in France, they had to very quickly reorganize themselves into four companies so that they'd be on the same uh, organization as the, as the British battalions. They had to hand in their Mark II SMLE rifles, 
uh, and take the, the Mark III. Now, there wasn't an awful lot of difference between the Mark II and the Mark III, except for the sighting systems. But of course, they'd have to be zeroed. I don't have to tell you that you can't just pick up anybody's rifle and hit the target with it. It's got to be zeroed to you. Uh, and the plan was that they would have a month. The initial plan was that they'd all have a month um, in Orléans to zero their rifles, uh, or reorganize themselves in four companies, uh, and generally get used to the Western Front. But that, of course, simply couldn't happen uh, because of the first battle uh, of Ypres. And they were simply thrown in. Um, a company here, a company there, a battalion down the road. Um, quite often, brigade commanders had no idea where the battalions were. And occasionally, company commanders didn't know where the uh, commanding officers didn't know uh, where their, their companies, companies were. Um, it was said at the time that they'd saved the empire. Um, I think that's probably an exaggeration, but I think they certainly saved the BEF. They arrived just in time and just in enough strength to fill those gaps when the Germans were trying to break through the Ypres salient to get to the Channel ports. And they did, they did very good work. Um, it's quite interesting to look at the re their reaction uh, to Europe. These are men who'd never been to Europe. Uh, many of them had never crossed the Kalopani, the, the black water, the sea. Um, they certainly would have known very little about Germany. They probably wouldn't even have known exactly where Germany was. But these are professional soldiers, all volunteers. There was no conscription ever in the Indian Army. And they simply accepted. Um, and reading their letters, it's a joy because everybody's letter, everybody wrote a letter from the Western Front. The letter was censored not just the Indian Army, but British Army, everybody's armies. And the reason they were centred, of course, was to make sure that if the, the postie got captured uh, <clears throat> by the Germans, uh, there was nothing in the letter that might help them, that might, might give away uh, future planning or anything like that. And um, because the, the Indian censors, they would all have spoken uh, one language, the language of their own regiment, but they wouldn't have spoken all the Regiment, the languages of the of the Indian Army, so the letters were all translated uh, into English uh, for them to be censored. So the original letter went off eventually to to India, but the English translation still exists. They're, they're in the in, in um, the British Library. Uh, they used to be down at um, Blackfriars in the Indian Office Library. They're now in the Indian and Oriental section of the British Library, um, and it's very interesting reading them. Um, things like, um, oh, one letter says, uh, which is from a Sikh, he says, this is a wonderful country. The women do all the work. Well, of course, most of the men were in the French army. Uh, so yes, the women would have to do quite a lot of the work. Uh, another letter says, the French are very strict about thieves. Any thief who's caught is taken to a crossroads and nailed up to a piece of wood. And this was a misunderstanding of what a cavalry was. Now, as you know, even today, uh, off the main routes, uh, every little crossroads in France has got a cavalry. You know, it's got a cross and, and, and a crucifix. Um, and they obviously thought, "What's all this? Oh, it must be it must be how thieves are thieves are punished." Um, there was a little problem in Orléans once the first battle of Ypres was over, and there could be some uh, roulement of of Indian units. Um, because they saw in Orléans this great statue of Joan of Arc. Ah, this is obviously a goddess uh, of, of the British and the French. Uh, so squads of men marching past tended to give an eyes right and salute this statue. And eventually they had to be told, no chaps, actually Joan of Arc was not uh, a goddess. Uh, Joan of Arc was actually an enemy and we burnt her in Rouen. Uh, so no more, no more saluting. Um, but it's interesting looking at the letters because they're all, they're very humdrum, very straightforward. Uh, how are the crops doing at home? Has so-and-so got married yet? Um, you know, ha how's the building of the school coming on? Very, very straightforward. There's no sort of um, description of, of blood and guts or anything like that. And I think one has to remember that a British soldier was writing for his wife or his girlfriend or his mother or his father or whoever. The Indian soldier was writing for the world because back in the village, most of the village would have been illiterate and the letter would, have be, would be taken to the village letter writer and he would read it out 
to the whole of the village who'd be standing around there or sitting down listening to it uh, so the indian soldier wrote wrote for the world um indian soldiers were all literate they were they were taught if they didn't uh, know how to read and write and they joined the army through no fault of their own there just weren't schools available uh, the army taught them um but sometimes they'd get the company clerk who was a, an educated chap uh, to write their letter home. So some of them are really quite flowery and you can you can see the the influence of the babu uh, who's who's really doing some very very sort of flowery uh, language. Um, but but they're there and they give a very good idea of, of what the what the soldiers thought and uh, and, and uh, how they saw how they saw the war. Um, the infantry on the Western Front uh, about a quarter Gurkha, uh, just over a quarter Muslim uh, just over a quarter Hindu and slightly less than a quarter uh, Sikh. Um, and again, you know, a hell of a lot of Muslims uh, fighting fighting on our, on our side. Um, the uh, the Indian Corps breakdown by races, just, just to show you, um, there's, there's this tremendous variation. Um, this is by, by companies, uh, by infantry companies. 24 companies of Gurkhas uh, in six battalions, all... Uh, class regiments, 17 and a half companies of Sikhs, 12 and a half companies of Punjabi Muslims, 11 companies of Pathans. There was a bit of a problem with the Pathans. Um, there was only one all Pathan regiment. That was the, that was the 40th Pathan, known inevitably as the 40 Thieves. Um, it was quite difficult uh, if you were a British officer with um, a Pathan regiment, and there was only one. Uh, there were some companies of Pathans in class company regiments um, because they had a tendency to desert. And when you think that um, in the tribal territories, um, which was really no man's land between Afghanistan and, uh, and British India, a rifle was worth about four years' pay. So there was a tendency to desert. Um, and there was a tendency to, to a certain amount of religious fundamentalism, which you didn't get amongst um, the other Muslims, the Punjabi Muslim, for example. Uh, Garwalis, uh, there was the Garwalis, uh, prior to 1895, Garwalis, who are next door to Nepal, could join Gokha regiments. Uh, and when their own regiment was formed, um, two battalions of them on the Western Front, uh, they still uh, wore kukris and a version of the Gurkha hat. And of course, they're constantly being mistaken for Gurkhas. They don't look at all like Gurkhas, actually. But but if you don't know, and you see this chap wearing a Gurkha hat and carrying a Gurkha, you think Gurkha. So they came to an arrangement whereby um, Gurkhas turned their slouch hat up on the left side, and Garwals Walis turned theirs up on the on the right side. Now, now everybody could, t could tell the difference. Uh, Dogras, seven companies of them. Rajput, four and a half companies. Uh, four companies of Jats, again, Jats from the Punjab, one and a half companies of Brahmins. Now, Brahmins were difficult. Um, and it was a pity because they tended to be big, strong men, uh, usually better educated than, than other people. Uh, but the restrictions of their religions were such that it was very difficult uh, in an army. Um, they, technically, before they ate, everything made of leather had to be removed. They'd have to take their boots off and their equipment off. Now, that didn't apply in the army. Obviously, it, it, it couldn't. Um, crossing the Kalopani was a problem for Brahmins. Um, and before the regiments uh, embarked, the Brahmin companies were told, look, chaps, it'll be a bit different once we get over there. Are you happy to drop some of the normal restrictions? And they all said, yes, of course they would. Uh, but it got increasingly difficult as time went on. Um, very often when they were hungry, they couldn't be fed because they could only eat food cooked by another Brahmin. Uh, when they were wounded, they could only be tended by someone who was another Brahmin. And that, okay, that could, be, could be a problem. So after the First World War, the number of Brahmins in the Indian Army, already not very many, uh, were reduced uh, even, even more. Uh, one company of Punjabi Hindus, they're Hindus from the Punjab, and a company of, uh, of Marathas. Um, looking at the Indian cavalry, uh, there was a cavalry brigade, the Secunderabad Cavalry Brigade, went off to the Western Front. 
uh, and that was um, uh, three battal- three regiments of of Indian cavalry, and a regiment of states forces, the the Jodhpur Lancers. Now they're from they're not part of the British Indian Army. They're from the Army of Jodhpur, but they were trained and equipped uh, to British British standards, uh, and they're they're there as well. Um, of course, when the things settle down on the Western Front, as you know, eventually there are uh, three British and two Indian cavalry divisions. And although the infantry leaves at the end of 1915, uh, the two cavalry divisions stay right up until spring of 1918. They, they leave the Western Front when Allenby wants more cavalry uh, for Palestine. Um, and although you know people criticize the cavalry they said these are government sponsored polo clubs I and mean, what what use can they possibly be in modern war but actually there were occasions when they were very useful indeed both british and indian cavalry um the great cavalry drive to berlin of course uh, never happened um but high word now those of you who know the western front which it'll be most of you will recognize this this scene uh, a photograph taken on the 14th of july uh, 1916. Um, behind us, really where I am now, is uh, Bazantin. Uh, off to the right, um, as we look at it, uh, is Delville Wood. And over the top of the horizon uh, is High Wood. Uh, this road is still there, um, except that it's now, um, of course, tarmac. It was then a, a laterite road. Uh, there's a track running up, which is is still there. Some of you may well have walked up it and over off the slide off to the left there was a windmill the windmill's not there anymore and this was the second phase of the battle of the Somme and between Highwood and Delville Wood off to the right uh, there was German infantry and wire Um, and how are we going to get rid of those well the answer is send in the cavalry Uh, so there was an Indian cavalry regiment the British cavalry regiment both went in um, The Germans would have thought, ho, 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 what's this? They'll never get over the wire. However, the Indians had got a way of getting over wire. Now, horses, without getting into too much detail, um, horses have a real problem with barbed wire, as you'll know from from hunting. They either don't see it till too late and then try and cat jump it and rip up on their tummies, or they don't see it at all. but they do see a picket. Now, horses are not stupid. Um, If you try to put them at a picket, they'll go round it. Why not? And they'll run into the wire. So what the Indian cavalry had done was they'd taken some of their really good riders and put them on really good horses, and they'd trained the horse to jump a picket. Not to go round it, but to jump it. Uh, So when they had to take uh, on barbed wire, the order would be, wire! And the rough riders, the the expert riders would come to the front. The other cavalrymen would slot in behind them. A horse is a creature of habit. It will follow the horse in front and they'd get over the wire. And they did wonderful work spearing lots of Germans and driving the Germans back in uh, to high wood. Um, As you know, they didn't take high wood. Cavalry really aren't much good in in woods. Uh, And high wood wasn't taken until much later. But that was a very useful example of what, um, what cavalry uh, could could do. Uh, you'll notice that the tails of the um, Indian cavalry aren't docked. They don't dock the tails. The British cavalry did dock their tails. Um, as a horseman, I strongly object to docking tails because you're taking the horse's fly whisk away from them. Uh, I know why the British cavalry always did it. Uh, it was to make life easier for grooming because, of course, the tail picks up a lot of a lot of mud. Um, and another very useful little bit of work that they, the cavalry did um, was in the aftermath of Cambrai. Now, at the end of 1915, um, November 1915, the, the two infantry divisions left the Western Front. I'll come back to them in a moment. But the cavalry stayed on. And you'll remember that the Battle of Cambrai, which is a, a, a roaring success, um, and unfortunately, there aren't any reserves to capitalize on that success because Lloyd George has sent them all off to Italy. Um, and the Germans counterattack and they recapture quite a lot of the land that's, that's taken, including the village of Villers Guzla and uh, Gauche Wood, 
and I expect quite a lot of you will have, will have been there. And there's a wonderful combined arms operation on the 2nd of December, 1915, uh, which involves Hodson's horse. And that's, there they are. And that photograph was taken just before they get involved. Um, and you can see the, um, the, the, the Gemini here checking his map. Um, so it's Hodson's horse on horses, 14 tanks from H Battalion of the 2nd Tank Brigade, a battalion of the Grenadier Guards, and two troops of the Royal Horse Artillery. So it's a wonderful example of, of combined arms. Um, and the ground, and, and they retake, they take Gauchewood and they take Bitters Guzela. Um, the ground really hasn't changed at all. Gauchewood is still there. Villers Guzlin hasn't got too much bigger. Um, the sunken road, those of you who know the, the battle, and it doesn't matter if you don't, but essentially uh, Hodson's horse came galloping over the hill. Uh, there was a sunken lane into the sunken lane. They got off their horses, drew their rifles, and uh, formed a line uh, along the bank so that they could shoot uh, into, into Gauche Wood. Um, as you know, of course, British cavalry and Indian cavalry uh, were trained really as mounted infantry. They had the same rifle as the infantry, which was not the case with French cavalry or German cavalry. <clears throat> but, uh, but it was a wonderful little operation. Um, and Lance Daffeta, um equivalent of corporal in the cavalry, Gobin Singh of Gardner's Horse, uh, won the Victoria Cross uh, <coughs> for um, constantly galloping up up the hill to report to the brigade commander what the regiment was doing. And he kept going backwards and forwards, getting and forwards. The classic, he has four horses shot under him. <coughs> He's quite badly wounded himself, but he keeps going and, and gets, uh, gets Victoria Cross. Um, the other element, of course, are the sappers and miners, the equivalent of the Royal Engineers. And again, the racial makeup, um, about a quarter Hindu, um, about a quarter Sikh and uh, about a half Muslim. My carer has just brought me a glass of water. Excuse me. Hmm. Delicious. Right. So there were only four companies of Saps and Miners, which doesn't seem very many for two divisions and a cavalry brigade, because normally um, each brigade would have its own company. Um, but the Indians, Indian divisions had something that uh, British divisions wouldn't have for another year and a bit. And that was a pioneer battalion who were sort of um, <clears throat> engineers without the degrees, if you like. They were, they were field engineers. Um, one of the pioneer battalion, the Sikh, uh, Sikh pioneers, uh, had as its motto uh, the Latin out viam in veniam out fuciam, which means either find a road or make one. And of course, if you're in India, which is relatively undeveloped, uh, your engineers have to be able to turn their hands to just about anything. Uh, and one of the things they were able to do, which was very popular in the whole of the army, not just the Indians, uh, was to produce a mortar. Now, when the British army go over to France and Belgium in 1914, they don't have any mortars. The Germans have got lots. Uh, we don't have any don't have any until the following year. Um, officers do uh, try to take out mortars from French museums that were last used to shell the British at Waterloo, but they're not really uh, terribly good. So the Indian sappers and miners, they say, right, we will, we will design a mortar. Uh, and this is the Mark I mortar that they designed. It's actually wood. The barrel is wood wrapped with wire and it could fire six pound shell uh, at a range for 400 yards, propelled by black powder. So they brought uh, the, the, one of the initial uh, Mark I mortars, this is a surviving one, the, the others didn't, uh, up to the front line. Uh, and the first one, I think they fired about 12 shells and then it, it burst its barrel. But that was all right, because what they then did, they, they proved that the system works they then took over a, um, a steel pipe making factory in Batoon and they started turning out these mortars, but this time made of steel, steel barrels rather than, rather than wood. 
and the rest of the BF were pretty keen on this and, and took it up until eventually, of course, the Stokes mortar, which appears uh, rather later on, and that, that replaces it. Well, they've um, they fought in the Battle of First Eve, as I said, uh, blocking up the, the gaps and arriving just in time and in just enough numbers to make the difference. Uh, and then they're going to be given their own sector. Um, and once they do get their own sector, um, we've got the, the Belgians holding 12 miles of the Western Front from Newport down to the top of the Eep Salient. The British holding 27 miles round the Eep Salient and a bit below it. And then the British Indian Army holding a further eight miles and the French holding 342 miles. Um, so the Indians are holding almost a quarter of the BEF's line. Um, you will know from reading that excellent book, Mud, Blood and Poppycock, that um, in general, men did not spend too much time in the front line. There was a constant roulement. Um, front line, reserve line, um, front line, support line, reserve line. The Indians had to spend a bit longer because an Indian battalion was only 720 strong, whereas a British battalion was 1,000 strong. But as far as the powers that be were concerned, this was a division, an Indian division, two Indian divisions. They would hold the same length of front as a British division. So they're having to do that, uh, but with less men, and therefore they don't get the same roulement that uh, the British soldiers uh, would have done. Um, it was pretty traumatic. Um, the, as an example, the, uh, the second battalion, the second Gotha Rifles, uh, arrived in France on the 28th of October. Now the rest uh, of the troops, most of them arrived in September, but the second second Gurkhas were part of the Derodun Brigade. The Derodun Brigade were held back uh, to guard the, the Suez Canal, uh, and they were then relieved by a Territorial Force Brigade. Uh, there, so they arrived on the 21st, 28th of October, um, and they're into the line the following day. So they've arrived in Europe, straight into the line on the, on the 29th of October. Um, they've had half a day to zero their rifles. And on the 2nd of November, just three days later, they're attacked, There's a very serious uh, German attack north of Neuve Chapelle, not the Battle of Neuve Chapelle, that's much later. And in that uh, German attack, which goes on all day and most of the night and most of the next day, there are eight British officers uh, in the line and seven of them are killed and the eighth is badly wounded. So the only British officers left are the commanding officer, the adjutant and the quartermaster because they weren't uh, in, the, in the front line as, as you wouldn't expect them to be. Now bear in mind that uh, there are only 11 British officers in the battalion. That is, a, that is a very serious thing. Even more serious, or as, certainly as serious, the Sugdar Major is killed, the senior gap officer is killed. And the four uh, company second in commands, Subadars, uh, are killed. 44 uh, Gurkha other ranks uh, are killed and 99 are wounded. Now that figure is not very much compared to the sort of casualties that battalions would be taking, say, uh, on the Somme. But nevertheless, for their first visit um, to the trenches, it was, it was pretty serious. And particularly serious was the loss of, of British officers. Now the, the Indian Army reserve of officers effectively didn't exist. So when you got British officers taken out, um, the, the, where were you going to replace them? Um, now, it wasn't too difficult to replace British officers in British regiments. There were lots of still people coming out of the universities and the grammar schools. They spoke the same language, well, more or less spoke the same language as their men. They ate more or less the same food. They understood the culture. Uh, but of course, you couldn't just take somebody from university or grammar school or public school in England and put them straight into an Indian battalion because he didn't speak the language, didn't understand the culture, it didn't work. Uh, you, you, they needed time. So the reinforcement of, of British officers came from battalions still in India. Um, initially, if they were a Sikh, uh, you had to replace British officers in Sikh battalions, then you took officers from who were with Sikh battalions in India. But that didn't always work, and quite often officers had to be taken uh, from 
regiments of a completely different race uh, and put in uh, to command uh, troops whose language they did not speak. Um, my uh, second battalion, my own, the first battalion role in my own regiment, um, at one stage were commanded by a lieutenant uh, from one of the Sikh regiments who didn't speak Gokhali, but his subdar major and the uh, Gurkha officers spoke Urdu. So he would tell, brief them in Urdu and they would then brief the men in Gokhali. And quite a lot of that happened. The Indian Army had learned the lesson. And by the Second World War, there was a goodly sized Indian Ar Army uh, reserve of officers. So this, this uh, didn't happen. Of course, the death rates in the Second World War weren't, weren't as great. Well, the Indian Corps, the two divisions, they fought um, First Battle of Ypres, as I've said, uh, and Second Ypres. Um, they fought both Festo Bears. There was Festo in 1914, which not many people know anything about, and Festo 1915. They fought in both. Neuve Chapelle, uh, which is still a great day in the Indian Army today. Uh, when I was in India um, last year, um, the uh, Garwal Rifles were having their regimental day, which is the anniversary of the Battle of Neuve Chapelle. Um, it was the first time the British units, British Indian units, anybody uh, in the BEF had actually broken the German line and held uh, what they'd captured. Ober's Ridge uh, and uh, the Battle of Luce. Um, the casualties they had on the Western Front um, in the year they were there, or just over a year from September 1914 to November 1915, when they, they move off to Mesopotamia. British officers, 153 killed and 294 wounded. That's the equivalent of 40 battalions worth of British officers. And there's only 18 uh, infantry, Indian infantry battalions in the Indian Corps. Um, an Indian brigade had three Indian battalions and one British battalion. Later, uh, it was three Indian battalions and one British or Gurkha battalion. Um, so that, that is a huge amount, huge effect. Indian and Gurkha officers, 109 of them killed, 336 wounded. Uh, other ranks, 2,345 killed, 14,221 wounded, missing, most of whom were later found to be dead. Some of them were prisoners, 3,247, which means really that 50% of the Indian Corps on the Western Front are wiped out. Uh, they, 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 they're gone. Um, the wounded, uh, as we know, the British policy was to get wounded back to hospitals, those that required hospitalization, get them back to hospitals in England. Um, French hospitals uh, were needed for their own people. Uh, and the Indian military hospitals uh, mainly were in Brighton, including the Royal Pavilion. Now, those of you who have been to the Royal Pavilion, uh, if you're inside it, there are great paintings on the roof of dragons and demons and, and, and all sorts of oh, creepy crawlies. And I can just imagine some poor old Sikh or Gokha or Rajput being carried in, uh, put to bed and waking up and finding this thing peering over him. He must have thought he'd woken up in, in hell. Um, the rate of recovery in the Indian military hospitals, as for the British military hospitals, was exceedingly good. Once you got there, you almost certainly would live. Um, not everybody did. Um, Hindus were burned on the Ghat, uh, on the Downs, just outside uh, Brighton. And Muslims were buried up at um, Brookwood, um, not far from, from Aldershot. Uh, but generally the recovery rate was extremely good. Um, one of the canards uh, about the Indians, uh, which comes from the wretched private Frank Richards, uh, you know, uh, uh, he wrote two books, um, Old Soldiers Sob and Old Soldiers Never Die. And unfortunately, people take that to be a, a genuine historical record. And he gets so many things wrong. He says, we were next door to an Indian battalion. They were terrified. They were crouching at the bottom of their trench. We went over to them and shouted them at them in Hindustani, but they still wouldn't move. Well, this didn't ring true at all. Well, it turns out that the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, none of their battalions were ever next door uh, to an Indian battalion. But Richard's battalion was next door to a French colonial battalion from North Africa. So no wonder they didn't speak Hindustani. Uh, 
Um, and they also talk about the sick rate amongst the Indian Corps being much higher than it was in any British Corps. And on the face of it, yes, the sick rate was higher. If you then boil that down and take the, the sick rate amongst the British units in the Indian Corps out of it, the sick rate is actually less than it was in the British Corps. The, the um, Indians were perfectly healthy. The British um, health of the British regiments in the Indian Corps wasn't good because most of them had been in India for seven years. And the sudden conversion uh, back to the cold and wet Europe didn't, uh, didn't suit them at all. So there are a lot of canards uh, in, in books like, like Richard's. Uh, the other canard is the self-inflicted wounds. There was a, uh, a commission which looked into that and its report is in the, um, in the, uh, in the uh, British Library, uh, which shows that it's complete nonsense. Uh, there's no uh, record of self-inflicted wounds uh, whatsoever. Um, well, as I said, the Indian Corps move um, in, in uh, November. The cavalry stays there until uh, spring. Uh, while uh, they're on the Western Front, uh, of course, the Indian Army is involved uh, in Gallipoli. As we know, the idea in Gallipoli was that the Royal Navy would force the Narrows up the, through the Sea of Marmara, bombard Constantinople. That map on the right shows it as Istanbul. Actually, it wasn't called Istanbul until 1930, but never mind. Um, and the problem with Gallipoli, which was a disaster, was that the troops involved, with one exception, didn't know what they were doing. 400,000 British Empire troops involved in the Gallipoli campaign. The British simply could not support two major campaigns a thousand miles apart, and the Western Front had to take priority. Um, so 29th Division, uh, supposedly a British regular division, but actually it had been cobbled together from battalions that had come back from overseas garrisons all around the world. They hadn't really got time to shake down as a division. The staff didn't know the regiments. The regiments didn't know the staff. Um, then you had the Royal Naval Division, uh, the Royal Marine Light Infantry units. They didn't know what they were doing. Well, the poor old uh, sailors who joined the Navy thinking that they were going to drink rum and dance the hornpipe or whatever, uh, sailors do, and were told, here's a helmet and a rifle, you're a soldier. Uh, they, at this stage, uh, really, were, were half-trained and, and inexperienced. The Anzac Corps, excellent material, but again, uh, only partially trained and completely inexperienced. Not their fault. Um, the only troops who knew what they were doing in the Gallipoli campaign was 29 Indian Infantry Brigade. Uh, which was eventually three Gokka battalions and a Sikh battalion. Um, and they, of course, were regular soldiers, experienced soldiers, knew what they were doing. And they uh, captured uh, the heights of, of um, Sari Bear up here. Now, once you got up there, you dominate the peninsula. You, you've cracked it. You've got it. And a Gokka battalion took it and... With great difficulty, I mean, they 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 saw they had to march along here uh, through the Australian lines, uh, and then make their way up the hill. Now, I uh, walked it um, in broad daylight uh, with a GPS, and nobody was shooting at me, and I wasn't carrying a great pack and a rifle, and, and I found it actually quite difficult. Um, how they did it at night with no maps, Lord knows, but they did. They succeeded. The, the, um, the, the final push got a Gakka battalion onto the top. And all would have been well, except for the fact that the new army brigade that was supposed to, which had landed at Sovla Bay and was supposed to uh, come and reinforce them, got lost and never turned up. And eventually, uh, the Gakka battalion, all the British officers were either dead or wounded. There were none left. The Sovla Major, a chap called um, Gamasing Pun, uh, was commanding the battalion. Uh, they were eventually shelled off it by um, uh, Turkish artillery on, on the Asian side down here. So that was a chance lost. Uh, and as you know, eventually, uh, out comes Kitchener, says, this doesn't work, uh, withdrawal. Hamilton, uh, who, of course, was the commander-in-chief until he was relieved, wrote a letter after the campaign, which I've seen, which said, if only I'd had more Gurkhas, 
in Gallipoli, I would never have been held up by the Turks. What he should have said was, if only I had more people who knew what they were doing, I would never have been held up by the Turks. So that was that was a, a sad little uh, escapade that the, <coughs> the Indian Army had got involved in. Mesopotamia, well, the Indian Corps left um, a dangerous theater, but where the admin worked, i.e. the Western Front, and they moved to Mesopotamia, which was equally dangerous, and where the administration didn't work. Um, and I've often thought that Townsend and Nixon should have been taken out and shot, but that's only my opinion. Uh, the Mesopotamian campaign was almost entirely Indian. The reason the two Indian divisions were moved from Europe uh, to Mesopotamia was that it was felt that they could cope with the climate and the terrain uh, rather better than British troops could. And in any case, now the Canadians and the Australians are coming on stream, the territorial force is coming on stream, the new armies are coming on stream. So their presence on the Western Front isn't, isn't as uh, essential as it had been otherwise. Uh, they also served in Salonika, a pointless campaign in my view, quarter of a million Allied troops achieving really very little, um, except for a remarkable rise in venereal disease amongst the French, which if you've ever seen Mrs. Boris the Bulgar is somewhat surprising and I shall probably be arrested for saying that. Um, they also, of course, served in Palestine at guarding the Suez Canal. Um, and of course, in the um, in East Africa, a lot of Indian troops there. And finally, when the war was over, uh, in the Allied intervention force in Russia. And I found in Batumi, uh, covered in, in uh, foliage, a little uh, memorial to, to the Indian army who'd, uh, who'd been in the Allied intervention force in Russia. The Indian army um, mobilized 1.7 million men in the Second World War, uh, First World War, of which 1.3 million served out of India, and 74,000 of them were killed. They fought true to their salt in a war that really wasn't theirs against an enemy that they knew little about in a terrain that they'd never seen, and they fought well and gloriously and loyally and i believe we should we should remember them and thank you very much indeed uh for listening to me gordon thanks very much indeed that was uh, tremendous thoroughly enjoyed that and uh, learned an awful lot and so in the best traditions of what we do on these if, if you enjoyed that if you'd just like to raise your hands on the bottom of the uh, screen there as a as, an, as a uh, instead of the applause, and I can tell you, Gordon, that the the, the, the um, silent applause is is, is ringing round <laughs> with lots of hands being raised. So thanks very much, everybody. Just lower your hands there. That's that's tremendous. So I'm just going to now um, look at the uh, see the Q and A's, and I'm just going to uh, identify some of the um, questions. Gary, thanks for your question. You were you were you were hot off the uh, fast off the blocks, <laughs> Gary, uh, just before uh, eight. So you are live now, and if you'd care to uh, ask ask your question of Gordon. Oh yeah, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Gordon. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I am in the Western Front Association, but do you know, to my shame knew hardly anything about the uh, Indian army there. So I've been doing a bit of swatting up since um, since David announced the webinar. But I, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And you actually have already uh, answered quite a bit of what my question was about, which was the, um, the social background of the officers and men of the Indian army. And that was, that was really interesting. But there's one you mentioned about literacy, and, and I guess still that then India must have been a poor place for the vast majority of those who would join the army. Were, uh, and I noticed you've got the Brahmins there. Were there any of the untouchable classes, the, the Dalit type classes, uh, able to join the army, do you know? No, uh, the only uh, untouchables were 
uh, Lohars who were recruited as um, armorers. Now they're they're metal workers um, who are regarded as being low caste, um, and in, in those days uh, nobody else would 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 touch metal. So uh, an armorer uh, would be a lohar. Um, the tailors, the darzis, are um, low caste. If you needed tailors, of course. So there are a number of those people. Those were the, the jobs they could join to do. But the army was very um, strict about this. They were not to be ill-treated. Uh, any attempt by a, a soldier of a higher caste to um, discriminate against them uh, was stamped on very quickly. Um, now, of course, there was still, inevitably, um, the, the soldiers, whatever they might have, they might not have said so openly. But there was a certain amount of, you know, I'm I'm better than you are. But but yes, but they could only they could only join in those specific trades. They they weren't enlisted as um, combat soldiers. They most of the soldiers um, were actually recruited from the rural areas. They tended to be farmers, uh, small farmers, um, without access to education, which didn't mean that they weren't intelligent. Uh, I mean, the army uh, the, the army took the pick. Uh, and of course, uh, would teach them how to read and write, so, uh, and they'd learn very quickly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't well. Uh, I'm wrong on this, um, uh, Gordon. But the men actually looked they they looked quite proud. Uh, I, 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 of the shots that the, the pictures that we're seeing, have they been politically handpicked? But they seemed well nourished, quite noble men. Was was that actually a feature, or was it that little bit of um, uh, of um, picking, cherry picking going on there? Uh, no, uh, that's what they looked like. I mean, there are there, there are loads of photographs taken uh, of men on duty, off duty, and all the rest of it. Um, but the being a soldier was tremendously high status. You know, whereas in the British Army, um, it tended to be the last resort of the hopeless and the first resort of the helpless. Uh, you know, nice girls didn't go out with soldiers. Uh, some things don't change. But um, this was not the case in India. If you were a soldier, that, whatever rank you were, uh, that was regarded as very high status. So if you'd, if you'd got into the army, you'd won the first prize. Uh, so you, you did tend to get the better. And of course, they were, they were well fed in the army, which probably fed much better than they would uh, at home, um, they were paid regularly. They were clothed, uh, so they would, you know, they, they would look healthy. They were healthy. Right, thanks very much. That's that. Philip Norris. I'm just going to unmute you there. Uh, you're now live. Yeah, thank you very much, Gordon. Very interesting. Um, I'm quite a follower of the Indian Army. I've visited in India on many occasions, and have friends who told me that the hardest fighting uh, units were the Rajputs, not the Sikhs. Or the Gurkhas. Um, what, in your opinion, uh, from what you know from all the regimental records and the, the accounts and the records, were considered to be, I wouldn't exactly say the shock troops, but they're very hard fighting regiments and the most resolute. I think they were all, they will all tell you they were. I mean, if you ask a yes. regiment, he'll say it's the right, if you ask a Sikh, he'll say it's the Sikh. Um, it, I think it's very difficult to, 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 sort, them, to sort from them. Um, and they all thought they were top of the tree. I mean, um, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, the Gurkhas would have thought that they were the elite of the Indian Army. The Sikhs thought they were the elite. The Rajputs thought they were the elite. And I think they were all um, pretty good. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I'm slightly biased, but, but uh, you know, 30 years with Gurkhas. But um, no, I think in fairness... Um, they would all claim to be the best, which is good. You know, I mean, if you believe, you've got to believe in yourself. And, and they did believe in themselves. Unfortunately, they, um, they're fairly fatalistic, both, both um, Hindus, Muslims, and, and Gurkhas, who are largely Buddhist. Uh, they're, they're pretty fatalistic, which is a good thing in a soldier. Uh, you know, you're, uh, if, you're, if your future is already written when you are born, then you're going to get killed, you're going to get killed. Um, so there was less, and I'm not suggesting that they didn't mind getting killed, of course they did, but I think there was less lugubriousness, if you like, amongst um, Indian troops than there was perhaps amongst British troops. Um, 
the the Indian Army didn't have chaplains, for example. They didn't they didn't take uh, their priests with them. That was because Brahmin priests. It was almost impossible for them to cross the Kalapani because coming back they had to do Panipati, uh, which all Hindu soldiers had to do, but very difficult for a high caste Brahmin to do. So if you didn't take Brahmin priests or Hindu priests, which were all Brahmins, then you didn't take the Muslim Malvis and you didn't take the the all the other chaplains. That actually didn't matter because there was always somebody who knew what to do uh, for a religious holiday. Um, you you didn't need uh, religious support in the way that perhaps Christian units did. So there, there was a difference there. But as to who were the best, uh, they were all pretty good, actually. All right, super. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for your question there, Philip. Andy, I think you're unmuted, so... Um, you're live, Andy. Do you want to ask Gordon your question? Gordon, yes. So, uh, echo the uh, remarks of the previous two question, uh, contributors. Thanks for the uh, very uh, interesting talk. I wonder, do we know anything of what the Germans actually thought of the Indian troops, both as fighting soldiers and how they were treated as prisoners of war? Yeah, um, they were f very frightened of, of Indian troops. Interestingly, at uh, Neuve Chapelle, um, there were hardly any surrenders to Indian troops. They would they would go hundreds of yards away to find British troops to surrender to. And um, that was not because they were going to be ill-treated if they were taken prisoner by Indian troops, but I think they thought they would be. Now, of course, they, they weren't. I mean, Indian army military law was the same as British military law. Um, so they were, they were all frightened of them. Um, they tended to segregate them. Uh, in prisoner of war camps. Uh, Zossen was one of the prisoner of war camps with, with Indian troops. And uh, they were, there's a number actually of um, anthropological studies carried out by German academics. Uh, there was one actually I was reading the other day who um, was, was doing a study on, on Gurkhas. Now there weren't that many Gurkhas taken prisoner, but there were some. Um, and uh, this, this was a study on the anthropology of, of Gurkhas. So there's quite a lot of that going on. They were treated um, as well, I think, as any other prisoner. The letters coming back from Indian prisoners talk about them being hungry. And there's one lovely letter which says, if you could possibly send me 10 rupees and a pair of socks, I'd be most grateful. Um, because, of course, the, 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 uh, the, 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 by, by um, you know, end of 1917, the German population was starving or very nearly starving. Uh, and and so was the so was the, and the army weren't much better off, so they were getting the same rations. Uh, but uh, but no, they were they were they were treated properly. I mean, there wasn't, as far as I know, any instance uh, of them being mistreated. Good, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for your question there, Andy. Pat Adamson. The different religions. People I know that are Sikhs currently. Um, are inclined not to work terribly well with other religions. How did they work together? Did it cause any divisions when they were actually fighting? The army was, was pretty strict about that. Um, there was to be all regimentally standing orders, and I've read most of them, I think, said that the, on no circumstances was cast uh, to be a perquisite for, for anything. Um, the Sikhs by now, I think, are working perfectly happily. Of course, initially, um, they'd been ill-treated by the Muslims, they'd been ill-treated by the Hindus, but all that had pretty well settled down. Um, and army discipline made sure that they, there really wasn't a problem. I mean, it wasn't like uh, the Hungarians and the Romanians in the Second World War, for example, where they'd much rather be fighting each other than fighting the Russians. Um, that, that really didn't apply. So they, they didn't uh, seem to be a problem. The only thing with Sikhs was if you were a British officer sent to a Sikh battalion, you didn't want to be a smoker. Now, Sikhs regard tobacco, regard, and still do, I imagine, as appalling, terrible, didn't smoke. They drink as if prohibition is just around the corner. So if you were a British officer with a Sikh battalion, you had to A, be able to hold your leak liquor, and not be a smoker. So there's no matter of that. But, but no, they, they all got on pretty well together, actually. They didn't mix that much. They tended to socialize amongst their own, their own races. 
the only ones that were slightly different was that um, Gurkhas were allowed to use British uh, canteens. And that, had, that, had, that was something from the end of the mutiny. Uh, at the end of the mutiny, Gurkhas were given the rank of rifleman rather than sepoy and allowed to use British canteens, which actually they hardly ever took advantage of. But, um, but no, they, they, they all got on pretty well. Thanks very much. Gordon, Gordon Holmes. Did you get the same pair? Sorry, Gordon, you're, you're breaking up. I, c I didn't get the question. Yeah, apologize. Go for it again, Gordon, if you can't. Right, can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Right, okay. G Gordon's question, um, I, I believe, I've got it written down here, um, is were there religious requirements catered for and were there any problems with the burial of the dead Muslims? Uh, no, there weren't. Um, Hindus were cremated and the ashes were sent back to India and uh, put into the Ganges if they were Indian Hindus or into the um, Bhagwati if they were Nepali Hindus, they're Gaka Hindus. Um, Muslims uh, were buried, Muslims do bury, they don't cremate. Uh, they were buried off of Brookwood, so there's no, there was no problem there. Um, in, in the hospitals, of course, there were nurses of the various uh, races to look after them. There were also British nurses. Of course, British nurses could look after anybody. Um, but if you were um, a Muslim, you would prefer a Muslim uh, to look after you. And they, and, and they were there. So, no, there wasn't, there wasn't a problem of burying them at all. Right. Th thanks very much. Good Gordon, you're muted. Too, so, so uh, <laughs> for Lydia, thanks. Um, let me just, for Lydia Shaw, um, you're live. You want to ask a question? Hello, thanks very much. That's fantastic. Really interesting. Um, I don't know, uh, David, whether you can see my screen, can you? I can see you, not your screen. Okay. You, um, we've not enabled your screen sharing as an attendee, so... so, so okay, do, 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 never mind. What I've got on my screen is a, is a painting, a small watercolour painting. Oh, right, yes. Beg your pardon. That is cool. I thought that was Gordon that put that up. Yes. I can see it. Yeah. Can yeah. you see it? Yes, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's a, it's a small watercolour of a cavalry regiment on its way to VA Gislen. Uh, ah, yes. During yes. Combray in November 1917. Yeah. And that's all I know because that's what it has written on the back. Absolutely. Well, that's, by, that's the actual. By an artist called Maurice Meredith Williams. And I would love to be able to identify that cavalry regiment. And you mentioned that the cavalry. Uh, had left in 16, spring 16, and I uh, wondered if he 18. was still there. Spring of 18. Spring 18. Spring 18. I misheard you. I misheard you. Those, that would be either Gardner's horse or Hodson's horse. Right. Uh, those, those two regiments. Um, the whole of the, one of the Indian cavalry divisions was there, commanded by General Kennedy, but the two that are involved um, are Gardner's horse and uh, Hodson's horse. So those are those are two. Now the the sunken lane which they're in. Yeah. When, when I was last there, the wretched farmer was filling it in, and I tackled him. I said, "Do you know what this is? This is a bit important." And, and he sort of grunted in his Gallic way and went on shoveling. <laughs> That is fascinating because my, my original, I suddenly thought I'd show this to you because I, I didn't know. Um, but my original question was a very simple one. We saw the men on the boats. We didn't see the animals on the boats. Mm. Um, were there separate ships for cavalry regiments? How long did it take them to get there? What kind of state were the animals in there when they got there? Well, for, yes, you're quite right. The ships, uh, of course, were, were uh, we still do this. Uh, I mean, no, nobody keeps troop ships. When you need them, you take them up from trade. The wonderful anachronism, stuffed ships taken up from trade. Um, and they, of course, then had to be adapted to take horses and, and mules. Um, so stalls had to be built in the ships. Now, a horse actually um, will, will keep his fitness much longer than a, than a human will. If, uh, if you and I did nothing for a month, we'd be pretty unfit. But a horse actually does retain its fitness for a bit longer than that. Um, generally, the weather, I mean, it took them, um, it took them about a month. Uh, to get from 
Marseille or, or, or sorry, from Bombay or Karachi to, to up through the canal. Uh, but the horses were reasonably fed. Um, of course, they had to be mucked out every day. Uh, they did bring them up on deck. They, they had a ramp and generally they were brought up on deck and walked around. But of course, they got increasingly, um, <laughs> increasingly bolchy. I mean, if you keep a horse in a stall and don't give him any exercise at all, um, you can't cut down. You've still got to give them a certain amount of hard feed because you need them to be fit when you get to the other end. So you can't sort of rough them off and just feed them brown mash. I'm sorry, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, Makes so, sense. So, yeah, they would bring them up on deck and, and get a, get kicked and, and whatnot. But um, there were no, there, I don't think, that, I haven't read of any casualty to the horses on the way. Now, of course, once they got there, there obviously were, were casualties. But, but no, they, they traveled uh, pretty well. They, um, they loaded them usually by um, a belly band and picked up. And it's extraordinary just how, how quietly they'll, they'll do it. I mean, I've seen horses done that way now, picked up and put on boats. And they just, you know, even thoroughbreds. <laughs> so, um, so the answer is, yeah, they traveled pretty well, but you're quite right. The ships had to be adapted to, to carry them. And of course, they, it wasn't just the cavalry had horses. Uh, every company commander, both in the British units and Indian units, every company commander has a horse. In the Indian army, every British officer had a horse which subalterns in the British Army didn't have. Um, the horse is the Land Rover of the day, if you like. Um, field guns are pulled by six horses. So a huge number of horses, not just the cavalry horses. Um, and the, the ships have to be fitted out for them. The horses have to be looked after, they have to be mucked out, they have to be fed. But they do get to the other end pretty well, 100% um, okay. So, but th thanks very much for that, Gordon. David Snape, I want to unmute you there. David, you're now live. Um, interesting question there, fire away. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gordon, for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm interested in why James Wilcox was sort of retired. Was it simply because he liked the Indian Army too, too much and wasn't prepared to sacrifice them anymore? Or was it because, like a lot of Indian Army officers, uh, senior officers, he had to be removed because they really weren't up to it. I think Wilcox was up to it. I think he was rather shabbily treated. Um, I think one of the problems was that as a lieutenant general, he was senior to Haig. Yeah. Um, and of course, Haig was promoted uh, to, to command the BF. And, and I think Wilcox, although he doesn't say so in his memoirs, I think he slightly uh, resented that. Um, People said that he wasn't up to it. I think he was up to it because at that stage, the, the core headquarters in a sense was a post box. Now, some people will disagree with me, but at that stage of the war. Um, and he, although he was from a British regiment, he'd spent an awful lot of time with Indian troops. They had his complete, um, he, he, they, were, they were totally confident of him. He had their complete confidence. They liked him. He knew how to handle Indian troops. Um, his successor, again, was, was equally good. And his successor went on eventually to command a, a British Corps as well. Um, I, I think, but the answer to the question, I think Wilcox was, was up to it at that time. Um, whether he would have been up to it much later on in the war, possibly not. Uh, I mean, he was the most decorated officer in the army at one stage. He'd been in every campaign that you can think of. Um, and there's a memorial to him in, um, I think it's in, where I saw a memorial to him in India. I can't remember now where it was. It, it, I think it might be in the church in Merritt, but I'm not sure. But, um, I think he was, I think he was shabbily treated actually. Um, but, and part of it would have been the fact he would have, I think, resented being passed over for promotion. Although there's no way the British army would have accepted he, he wasn't an officer of the Indian Army, he was an officer of the British Army, but nevertheless, he'd been with Indians so much that I don't think they would have accepted him as, as commander of the BAF. And he, he wouldn't have been up to commanding the BAF, actually, to be fair to him. Um, but he was a good, good guy. Um, but um, I suppose he shot his bolt in a, in a sense. Okay, thanks for that, Gordon. Mick, Michael Phipps, uh, you're live. Yeah. 
Yeah, hi. Hi, Gordon. Excellent uh, presentation. Thanks very much. Tremendous knowledge. Um, part of my question has already been uh, answered, I think, because I was interested in how the Indian soldiers were treated, particularly when they were uh, prisoners of war by the various belligerents. You've told us about the Germans. How did they fare with the Ottomans? And also, um, I was in India in February, but I didn't see any commemoration or, or uh, museums or anything in, in relation to the army in the First World War. Is it something that India remembers at all or, or, or uh, creates any uh, um, honour to? That, yeah, they do remember it very much. The battle honours uh, that the Indian regiments won in the First World War are all still there. The only battle honours that have been removed are mutiny battle honours. Uh, because the, the Indian government now will tell you that it was the first war of, libera of um, independence, which is rubbish, but never mind. Uh, but yes, they certainly do. Uh, as I say, the Garwal Rifles in March, March the 12th, I think it is, celebrate uh, Neuf Chapelle Day. Um, the um, India Gate in uh, Delhi, you know, on the, on the Rajpath, uh, that now on Remembrance Day, 11th of November, there's a ceremony there. So they certainly do remember it. Um, as far as the Indian Army is concerned, there is no break in 1947. You know, it's still the regiment. And if you go into the office of, of a commanding officer of any Indian battalion, the paintings and then photographs of all his predecessors are there. So it's white face, white face, white face, brown face, brown face. So, you know, as far as they're concerned, um, the regiment goes on. Um, the question of prisoners of war, uh, they were properly treated by the Germans, not so by the, the Turks. Now, that I th uh, British prisoners were badly treated by the Turks as well. A lot of prisoners, whether they were British, Australians, um, French, Gurkhas, Indians, whatever, uh, died in, in Turkish prisoners of war camp. I think that was partly an Ottoman disregard for human life, which was part of their psyche anyway. Um, and also uh, incompetence, if you like, inability to, to administer the prison camps. So it was a sort of mixture of both, but they certainly weren't particularly well treated by the, by the Ottomans. Um, although they, they admired, um, I think everybody, admired uh, Kamal Ataturk, you know, the, the defender of, of Gallipoli. My great admiration for Kamal Ataturk is not so much as a soldier, though I think he's a very good soldier. He abolished irregular verbs by act of parliament. <laughs> now, what about that? There are no irregular verbs in modern Turkish. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. Th thanks, thanks for the answer there, Gordon, and thanks for your question, Rick. Uh, so, Suzanne Turk, uh, okay, Suzanne's question um, was, was this, what percentage of the Indian Army left the UK via Folkestone in Kent? So uh, the thrust of, of, of Suzanne's question is, did, did the Indian Army um, come into the UK and then cross the channel? Um, no, they, they, um, the only ones who came to the UK were people who came back to UK on courses uh, or to the military hospitals which were mainly around Brighton. Um, otherwise, they went straight from India, straight to France, straight to Marseille. So Folkestone, I live in Folkestone, actually. Um, and really, there is no, um, we do have a Gorka battalion up the road. But apart from that, uh, I don't think there was any Indian army involvement in, in Folkestone. No, no worries. Thanks for that. So, sorry we couldn't uh, get, you, uh, get you speaking there, Suzanne, quite in time, but not to worry. Thanks for your question, Suzanne. Um, right, we're now knocking on for half past nine. I've gone half past nine. So I'm going to just wrap up with just two more questions. So, um, Stephen Rees, just unmuting you there. Stephen, you're now live. Um, Thank your you. question, please. Um, Gordon, as with others, immensely enjoyable and every day is a school day, so you keep on learning, it doesn't stop. Um, for my sins, I'm doing uh, an MA and embarking on dissertation on, log on logistics. And I read an unusual item that when the Sikhs arrived in Marseille, um, they put in a request for Indian treacle, which was translated as opium. 
much to the shock of the quartermaster general, um, and they were struggling to find this opium. I mean, is that was that correct? The, well, of course, back in India, opium in small quantities was used as a medicine. That's right. Um, the, it wasn't issued by the army. Um, what they did issue, what they did ask for, was um, seven hundred safety pins. <laughs> and what the hell do they want safety pins for? And the reason was that when they arrived, of course, they're in uh, Indian summer uniforms, cotton uniforms. It's actually pretty cold, even in September, at the end of September, in uh, beginning of October in, in France. And they're issued with long johns, which are long underpants. Now, long johns are meant for sort of fat, tall British soldiers, not for relatively thin, not quite so tall, uh, Sikhs and Gakas and various others. Um, so the, uh, they, they said, could, could we please have 700 safety pins so they could you know, pin pin the the, the long johns up. Um, the whether they actually seriously asked for opium or not, and they may have done was tongue in cheek. They weren't going to get it. Um, but of course, it wasn't regarded taking opium in small quantities wasn't regarded with the horror that it would be today. Um, as long as they weren't addicted. I mean, they, they, obviously, any question of addiction, they wouldn't stay in the army. Uh, and they wouldn't, you couldn't soldier the requirements of physical fitness and everything else. Um, but uh, they wouldn't have been issued with it anyway. <laughs> thanks very much. Right. Um, thanks for your question. Then um, thanks for the answer, John. The last question, there's loads more still to come, but we, we just can't keep on uh, batting away till, till gone midnight. So let's just unmute Tony. Tony, you're now live. You've got a question there, and this is going to be the last question for, for Gordon. Well, Gordon, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Gordon, great. Thank you very much. Your knowledge is... You left the army the same year as I did, 98. Oh. Um, the, the question I have really is, is I think you've, you've, you've sort of gone around it, you talked about it, and that is when they arrived in Marseille, uh, I can't imagine because, as you say, they were in Indian uniform and in Indian, and they going into the, the French winter. Did they get complete reissue of clothing prior to leaving Marseille, or did they do it hobnobbly, as it were, on the way? Yeah, it was. It was done in some cases when they were actually in the trenches. The problem was not that nobody cared; people did care, but the textile industry in England simply wasn't up. They, they weren't. Um, I mean, the new army battalions of this period in England, uh, a battalion or a company, uh, you know, 150 men, would have one uniform. Yeah. And, of course, they all wanted their photographs taken. So they'd wear the uniform, then it'd be tailored to the next chap, tailored to the next chap, and so on. Yeah. Um, now, of course, at least the people in England weren't being shot at and weren't having to live in a trench. But um, it took some time before they all got um, equipped. Um, and certainly... Into December, some of them were still in in um, Indian cotton uniforms. They they issued them with trench. The first thing they did was try and issue everybody with a trench coat, with a, with a uh, a great coat, uh, which helped a bit. Uh, they issued them with long johns, um, and eventually they do get kitted out with uh, with with uh, serge uniforms. Uh, one of the things that given up is um, rifle regiment, of course, had black buttons. Not for the war. No black buttons. Everybody has the same sort of button. Uh, rifle drill, which, as you know, is is quite different from from cooking infantry drill. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, ordinary infantry drill. Um, that that was big. Well, cavalry. I'm cavalry. All oh, right. Well, that's okay. Then. I can be rude about the rest of the infantry. Um, that 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 went by the by the board. Um, things like black black chevrons went. You know, you had to wear the same chevrons as everybody else. Uh, and ev eventually, I mean, by by the spring of 15, everybody is in surge winter uniforms, but it does take time. And it's not because people didn't care. It was simply that the textile industry, they couldn't equip the Brits, never mind the, the Indians. So, so they, they must have been extremely uncomfortable then at the first Battle of Ypres. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't much fun. Um, of course, they do. They, I mean, Gurkhas come from halfway up the Himalayas, Sikhs, uh, from the Punjab, Gawalis from the hills, so they're pretty used to cold weather. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're not. It's not as if they they'd only ever been in the you know the hot plains. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, their sick rate is is lower than it is uh, for for 
British units, so so they cope pretty well. But it cannot have been. I mean, I have I've seen photographs of of them, you know, in, trying to sort of look cheerful in, when was it bloody freezing? Um, not not pleasant. But they do get kitted out eventually. Super. Thanks very much indeed for for your question there, Tony, and and thanks for that, um, Gordon. Right. So basically, uh, again, apologies to everybody. The, the dozens and dozens of questions that we've just not had a chance to, to get to, but uh, it's uh, it, it, we've uh, probably had a good crack of the questions there. So, Gordon, just leave me just to say thank you very much indeed um, for your contribution. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I think we've learned an awful lot. It's something that, uh, for whatever reason, we, we've not really looked at um, as a as, as an association, I suspect, uh, in, in, in detail before. Uh, so what we've done tonight is, is, is learn a great deal. So if, in, again, um, a, a, as we were in a, in a non-live meeting, I, I know we, we are uh, live but not in a, the same room, can people raise their hands once again as a, as a, as a gesture of, of applause? Um, and once again, all the hands are going up there, Gordon, so we can just imagine the, the applause ringing round. Uh, so again, thanks very much. The, just a little bit of um, marketing here, which is the um, keep an eye on the WFA website uh, for the next in the in the series of talks. The, these are all getting uh, nicely wrapped up uh, one after the other. So come along for, for, for the next one, which is on Monday, and we're going to do a recreation of a court martial, talking the exact words of the court martial. Um, there's no fiction in it, and, and it will be done by a number of volunteers each taking a part of the Willie Stones and DLI-6 court martial. So this is going to be really interesting, um, as long as we all hit our lines uh, correctly. And so that's on Monday night at 8 p.m. Uh, the, these webinars are um, getting loaded up one after the other on the WFA YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and check uh, a detail or watch them again, uh, please do subscribe to the Western Front Association's YouTube channel, which is just going through the roof in terms of the uh, number of subscribers. It's not a paid for subscription service. Subscription to the WFA YouTube channel is free. Just click on the subscribe button and you'll get automatic notifications of the videos that we load up. So please do go along and, and have a look at these, like these webinars and previous lectures on the WFA YouTube channel. So again, Gordon, Sincere thanks for, for your time this evening and um, appreciate very much um, your uh, lucid talk about the Indian Army in the Great War. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's always a great pleasure to talk to a, an educated audience. <laughs> thanks very much and good night, everybody. That's all. Cheers. Mademoiselle from Armitage, Mademoiselle from Armitage,